68th in Quimby Avenue in the city of Cleveland. My family grew up in this neighborhood. My old buddy, my old, old buddy, Maurice Newman, grew up in this neighborhood too. His grandmother used to live down at the end of the street on the left side. His father was born in this building. This is Maurice from the Quimby Road Gang. This is Maurice Newman. And when I used to walk up and down the street when I was three and four years old, when I was a baby, I lived on the corner, 65th and Quimby. Maurice was the bully. And he'd come over here and he'd pick on me and he'd kick sand in my face because this, this street was... You're recording that, but you got to record it accurately. <laughs> now the empty lot we're standing in front of is where Maurice's family, his grandmother lived and his father grew up. His father was born in 1915, am I right Maurice? Right. Where was he born? In this apartment building, right behind me. And then he just came across the street where he grew up. That's where his family lived. Now his uncle Asa, what year was Uncle Asa born? 1918. 1918. First World War, just getting underway. But Uncle Asa now lives in Chicago, and he was a member of the Tuskegee Airmen. He was an American hero. He left Quimby Avenue and went on to achieve a measure of success in World War II. And Maurice and I are out here taking some photographs looking around the neighborhood. We're looking for footprints to the Newman family. So Maurice came back here to claim what's rightfully his. Remember climbing on that tree, Maurice, when you were a little kid? Hanging from the rubber tire, swinging. What's hard to imagine is that uh, there were seven kids. Uh, my father had three brothers, three sisters. There was my, uh, there was my aunt Mildred was the oldest, and then my dad. Uh, my dad was the oldest boy. Then there was Asa, Leonard, there was also uh, Roseanne and Teresa and Paul. Evan, where'd your father fit in? He was the oldest boy, second, second oldest. Second oldest child, but the oldest boy. He was born in... October 24th, 1915. My father was born November 5th, 1921, six years later, right up the road. My, uh, my, I had a cousin, Jim, who lived here after my grandmother uh, passed. Jim uh, eventually moved out and he tore the house down. Uh, it needed a lot of work, I guess, at the time. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the, right there you can see a little bit of the brick. I mean, this was all brick at one point. When I used to come down here with the kids, the street was all brick. There's the brick road. Yeah. Just beneath maybe a little over an inch of asphalt. That's all they did, just covered it up. Hey, there's more brick there, too. It's hard to believe yeah. this apartment building is still here and still in, looks like it's in reasonably good shape. So we're at 1718 68th place. What was the address to the family home? Don't remember. Must Don't have been 1715 or we something could have like that. Call Uncle Ace and ask him, but I he would know, yeah. yeah. But it'd be an odd number and it'd be across the street. Now yeah. Right there on the, around here on Belvedere, there was uh, the McGuire's live. Lois McGuire went on to become the executive director of Caramu, the theater arts organization. So it was. Uh, it was a good little neighborhood. Maurice, I want to take you a little bit up the street, just a block west of here to 65th and Quimby. And this is where my family, my father and my aunts and uncles all grew up. And it's not too far from League Park. We're going to go over there in a few minutes. But we're going to walk around the corner and head one way on Quimby Avenue. You ready? Okay. Let's go, buddy. Maurice, you recognize this neighborhood? Absolutely. We're right now at 66th and Whippy. On Cleveland's east side. We're about uh, three miles from downtown Cleveland. Side of 60. Go over there in a few minutes, but I want to show you where I grew up, okay? Let's take a walk. Okay, buddy. Quimby Avenue. Now, when you say Quimby, that to me is home because my family grew up. This is Rosalind, and Rosalind is from the Dunham Avenue Christian Church, which was the first integrated church in Cleveland. In Cleveland. Now, how long have you been a member of this church? 56. 56. I was seven years old, and he was uh, 28. No, uh, <laughs> he's, he's a year older than I am, so I'm just teasing him. Yeah. So, where did you grow up? 89th Street, when the Negro League played here at Lee Park. Did you ever go to any games over there? Of course. 
on Sundays. They'd have double headers, but the second game had to stop at 7 because there were no lights. Now, my father worked in the clubhouse when he, was a, he? when he was a little boy, and my uncle did too when they were young boys in their early teens. Yeah, I'm surprised you had, well, of course you're young. <laughs> Thank you. I'm 65. <laughs> I was born in 1949. Where are you? And when I was born in 49, I lived in the house on the corner of 65th and Quimby and we moved to Collinwood. Oh, okay. Because I had an older brother and then a younger brother came along. And the house, house got too small. So and we, you had to expand. I had to expand. Had to expand. Yeah. Now, do you remember when the Indians in the Negro League played in League Park? Especially if you wanted to see a doubleheader. Doubleheader on, double those, on those concrete seats. All day, but yes. you did it because you enjoyed it. You enjoyed the you enjoyed the community. You because en we could walk. I mean, we walked from where I lived. Where did you go to high school? John Hay. John Hay. Now that was up on Carnegie. It was Carnegie and 107. And you walked down here. Or you took a trolley. I lived. Oh, I lived on 89th Street, and we walked. We walked. Oh, walked sure. everywhere you went. Yeah, because at that time Chester didn't go all the way through. So we were walked out. It was easy to get through. Do you remember the trolley coming down in Lexington? Nope. I know there's tracks. Yeah. In a picture that I have of the church here. Tracks up and down 66? It looks like 66th Street, the tracks. I have a picture. This is where our families began. This, this, this is, it was a beautiful neighborhood. Yes, it was. Beautiful was. Beautiful. Until the riots. Beautiful houses. The only thing I can remember, I was in my backyard and we heard shots and I didn't know what had happened. Now, Huff Avenue is just a block south. Do you remember the Huff Avenue riots? Of course. You were here then. I was living on 89th Street. I was in my backyard doing some work and I heard the shots. I had no idea what had occurred. You didn't recognize that day that riots were beginning. I did not know that, but my son was at the Y that was on Cedar Avenue and 76th Street for a youth group meeting. And I sent my husband up there to get him because I didn't know what was going to transpire and to bring him home. So the riots continued. Do you remember all the gunfire and the fires and all the yeah. loud explosions? All the businesses, the houses, everything that was burned. What were you thinking when that was going on just in your neighborhood? It was difficult to understand. Why do you want to destroy? This was a beautiful neighborhood. It has been the same since. No, no. It, it was a beautiful neighborhood it back was then, wasn't it? It was a beautiful neighborhood. I remember it very well. The, I remember the beautiful houses. The houses, the landscape, everything. It was beautiful. Yeah. And it was torn up. <laughs> well, Rosalind, I appreciate you talking to us. I appreciate you giving us a little bit of your memory of the history of this Quimby Avenue area. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. This is the uh, educational foundation I work with in the schools. On the back there's about a paragraph that says what we do. But, I work with kids mainly 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, but in some schools, but also the 3rd and the 4th grade, trying to build kindness, caring, respect, boost self-esteem, combat teasing, taunting, bullying, gangs, and drugs, and try to get the kids, because most of the kids I work with are from poor, disadvantaged neighborhoods. You want them to kind of, by the time they get to high school, to have a sense of purpose and direction. So they're not kind of playing their way through school and then finding out down the road it's too late. You know, so that's the mission anyway, or it's what we try to do. That uh, sounds a, like a good mission. I work it's, it's a, it's a tough the, population. I worked for the Cleveland School System. Yeah. My mother was one of the people that built the Head Start program for the Cleveland Public Schools. Uh, Julia Newman. Julia Newman, of course. Yeah, that was way back. Yeah, that she was, was my, my mother and Chris Branch. and Chris uh, Branch, I, I got a picture of her showing her at Judson. And that's going in one of my black history books. Yeah, well, that, that was, that was, my mother was, my mother, well, Chris Branch was the CEO and my mother was the COO. And, okay, yeah. okay. And they worked the Woody Hill Quincy building. No, it was Margaret Ireland. I said for a while. Oh, okay. You! Oh, they went <laughs> okay. to Margaret Ireland. Okay. Thank you very much. If you I started working in that building with 1970. This is the old neighborhood, because my family grew up one block west of here. 
My family on East 68th was about a block east of here. Let me show you where my family grew up. Let's take a walk. There's Utica Avenue. That's where my father used to cut through. But I lived in that house there when I was born for a year. And my father grew up in this house here. The house is gone, but the lot is still here, as you can see. These trees weren't here, but the house was narrow, because back then, of course, you got to remember, there were no automobiles when the houses were built. 1921, my father and his brothers and sisters, they all grew up right here. And I could remember the water, the water outlet, the water spigot, tripping over that when I was about three and a half years old. And my father was leaving, chasing him down the street. I wanted to go with him. The front porch, the family, the home, all of it right here. Everything happened. I remember the house next door. I can remember this house. It's, it's like, uh, that's 65 years ago, 62 years ago, 60 years ago. But the memories are still here. And my father and my uncle, from here, they'd walk out the back through the grapes that my grandmother and grandfather had, through the alley and on the Utica Avenue, and then over on the 65th, and then one block over to League Park, where they worked in the clubhouse. And they worked in the clubhouse over there every day until my father left for the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was a New Deal agency. But this backyard, I could remember digging in the backyard, helping my grandmother and grandfather uh, plant grapes and trim up back here. It's all like it was yesterday, but the house, house isn't here anymore, but the memories still survive. You want to take a walk over to League Park with me? Sure. You didn't bring any bat, any, any glove, any baseballs? She Where's called me. <laughs> we, we need a caddy. We need somebody. I thought you were going to be my bat boy. All right, let's go. Can you pitch? Can you throw a curveball? You can't hit it. <laughs> so what's the point? <laughs> all right, let's go. <laughs> Lexington. Behind me is League Park. Behind me is League Park, the entrance. This is where you bought your tickets. You can see how inexpensive the tickets were. You can get it in for 75 cents back in the 1930s. On the inside here, my father worked. He worked in the clubhouse. It was built in 1891. It was renovated a couple of times, particularly in 1910, 1911. The Cleveland Indians played here. Over that wall over there, Babe Ruth hit home run number 500, August 11th, 1929. Now let's take a walk inside. Let's go see where it all happened. You're around the corner, 66 in Lexington. Here is where you bought your tickets. And down here was the first baseline. 290 feet down that right field line for Babe Ruth to pop a home run over the right field wall. He hit home run number 500 over that right field wall on August 11th, 1929, after hitting 60 home runs just two years before for the New York Yankees. Now let's take a walk inside. Johnson, Tris Speaker, who played for the Indians. We're going to go on the inside. We're going to look at where these guys patrolled the outfield, the infield, the sidelines, the dugout. My father worked in the clubhouse. The cl 
clubhouse is not here, it's not the same. My uncle worked in the clubhouse. They used to catch fly balls in the outfield. The baseball players would allow them to use their equipment to go out there and shag fly balls. I'm walking down the right field, first baseline for League Park. The Indians occupied the first base dugout back when this was League Park and even at Cleveland Municipal Stadium, which was built in 1932. That's the original ticket booth down there. Now it's been reconstructed and it looks exactly as it did back in the 1900s. Let's take a walk on the inside. And let's go see where the Indians, Tris Speaker, Napoleon Lazoway, even Ted Williams in, a, in Babe Ruth, where they roamed the outfield and they played baseball back in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s. stood in that batter's box. Babe Ruth stood in this batter's box. The babe was here. Crack. Boom. August 11th, 1929. Hit home run number 500 over the right field wall. That 60 foot wall, 290 feet away. Babe Ruth did it right here. In 1887, two brothers, Frank and Stanley Robeson, owned the Cleveland City Railway Company and they were involved in a lawsuit. As part of that lawsuit, they got part ownership of the Cleveland baseball team, the Spiders, back in 1887. So they had an idea. They had the trolley tracks, they owned the trolley line that came right past here. They decided to build a baseball stadium, a field, right here at their trolley stop. So they did, and they opened it up on May 1st of 1891. 26 years after the end of the Civil War, they were playing baseball right here. The baseball players would allow my father and my uncle to use their baseball mitts and go out in the outfield and they'd shag fly balls during batting practice. Bob Feller, Lou Gehrig played here. Right here down the third base line was the visiting team dugout. In this dugout, of course, Lou Gehrig played, Babe Ruth played, Walter Johnson played. A lot of great performers came through here. Of course, Ted Williams. Ted Williams, the last guy to bat 400. Bob Feller made his major league debut on this mound. Left-handed batter, August 11th, 1929. Babe Ruth, home run number 500. Boom, right down the right field line, over that fence, 290 feet away, 60 foot high wall. Babe Ruth cleared that fence. Bob Feller pitched off this mound. Bob Feller was a rookie with the Cleveland Indians, pitching off this mound here in League Park. Here at second base, the only unassisted triple play ever recorded in World Series history. Bill Wamsgans for the Cleveland Indians picked off a line drive hit by Clarence Mitchell. He doubled up. Pete Kilduff going down the line. Tag Otto Miller coming from first base. Triple play, unassisted by the Cleveland Indians second baseman, Bill Wamsgan. Down the right field line. Babe Ruth, home run, landed on Lexington Avenue. 290 feet, 460 feet to dead center. Down the left field line, 375 feet. Everywhere you look at, it's your nose. Where have you gone? Show the magic of one nation turns its lonely eyes to you. Ooh, what's that you say? You remember a guy by the name of Joe DiMaggio? 
Joe DiMaggio hit in 56 straight games. His 56th straight game was here at League Park. It ended the next night when they went down to the stadium and they played on the lakefront. Kenny Keltner at third base made some great plays to halt the streak of Jolton Joe DiMaggio. May 1st, 1891, the Cleveland Spiders opened up this park. The winning pitcher, the opening day pitcher, Cy Young. August 16th, the shortstop for the Cleveland Indians was Ray Chapman. Ray Chapman played shortstop in August of 1920. When they went to play in Brooklyn, Ray Chapman took a pitch to the temple. Struck him and knocked him down, and he died the next morning. He's the only baseball player ever to be killed as the result of something that occurred during a Major League Baseball game. Here in the on-deck circle, for the Cleveland Indians, behind me was the Cleveland Indians dugout. Managing from that dugout, back in the early 1900s, was Tris Speaker. He also played the outfield. Tris Speaker was player manager for the Cleveland Indians. Opening day, 1936, Cleveland Indians played the Detroit Tigers. Right in sunny day. My father was 14 and a half years old. He worked here. He worked in the clubhouse and he worked here selling programs. They were called scorecards because people actually kept score of the game, who made it out, who got a hit, who did what, when, what inning. And my father sold those scorecards. And you can see this photograph of the ladies preparing the scorecards for the young kids to pick up and walk around League Park and, and later at Cleveland Stadium to sell the scorecards. And when my brothers and I got old enough, my father got us jobs selling football programs at the Cleveland Browns games all throughout the 1960s. We saw every game, saw every player, got to see the Cleveland Browns win the 1964 championship game against the Baltimore Colts, 27-0. Ryan the Collins three times with two field goals by Lou Groza. Something you'll never forget as a young kid. But it all happened here in Cleveland Sports History. They played their last game here at League Park. And history closed the final chapter on this great ballpark. Everything has to change. Everything has to move along as the cycle of life moves along. But we have to understand the memories. We've got to appreciate the memories in order to understand who we are and appreciate how we got to be where we are. My father was a little kid, my uncle was a little kid. They roamed these fields, they had a good time. This was all before World War II. We are very much aware of where we are, what we're doing here, and the name of this place, of course, is uh, League Park, and it's one of the greatest and most iconic baseball fields left. The only other parks that were, that were made in this uh, time period was 1912, Fenway Park, and of course, Wrigley Field. But it's all part of American history, it's all part of who we are. It's all part of growing up here in Cleveland, Ohio, at the center of the rock and roll universe. Little did we know. I'm gonna see if I can get a hit off Bob Feller. <laughs>